that you can do things. Just well, hello. Welcome, everybody, to our audience here and also our audience watching the live stream around the world. My name is Dr. J.D. LaRock. I'm the president and CEO of the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, also known as NIFTY. We're a global nonprofit that works in the United States and around the world to help young learners and adult learners from underserved communities learn how to start businesses. And we're here today to talk about an important and very timely topic, how to prevent learning loss. And as all of you know, this has been a period in the world where learners have made a lot of strides backwards due to the pandemic, due to economic crisis, due to disinvestment in global education systems. I'm joined today by a fantastic panel who will shed light on this important issue, and let me introduce them briefly. To my left, Catherine Russell, the Executive Director of the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. Next, Dr. Mohamed Ahamadeh, CEO of Amanat Holdings out of Dubai, making investments in education and healthcare. Next, Dr. Ashish Advani, President and CEO of JA Worldwide, Junior Achievement, another excellent entrepreneurship education organization. Next, Jeff Tarr, CEO of Skillsoft, a leader in uh, upskilling and reskilling and transforming workers and workplaces. And then finally, at the end, Rachel Romer, CEO and co founder of Guild Education, another real innovator in the education benefits and workforce space. Let me provide a little bit of context before we jump into our discussion. And you can see on the screens here some of the statistics that have really bedeviled us in this present situation. By age 10, only half of children around the world have developed foundational reading skills. According to the latest estimates by UNICEF and the Education Commission, nearly three quarters of young people aged 15 to 24 in 92 countries are off track to acquire the skills they need for employment. According to the OECD, it is likely uh, that less than half of 15-year-olds have spoken to a career counselor in school, visited a job fair, or performed an internship. And 75% of young people say they would have liked more support from their schools in finding a job. So today's session will take stock of all of these <laughs> challenges, but we're also going to talk about the positives how we go from where we are to forge a better path for tomorrow. But let me start with Catherine. Provide us with a foundational view on what you see mm -hmm. around, about learning loss around the world, particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic. OK, great. Well, thank you, JD. And thank you for doing this <clears throat> Excuse me, important session. I think the way we look at learning loss and learning crisis, it's really the failure of education systems to actually teach children in the classroom and to keep them in the classroom. It has many different causes, uh, and that really can vary depending on the context. It can be a, an inadequate or really poor curriculum. It can be very crowded classrooms, and we've all seen photos of this, you know, 75, 80 children in a classroom, one teacher trying to manage that. It can be a lack of testing that ensures that each child is actually being taught at their level, um, and it also is poor support for teachers uh, and more. And as you say, you know, our estimates actually are for pre-COVID, it was about 50% of 10-year-olds couldn't read a simple sentence. Post-COVID, that's closer to 70%, which is an astounding number when you think about that. So it just gives you an idea um, of how, how vast this problem is. And, and really, the result, regardless of what the causes are, is the same, which is that children aren't learning. It does differ across regions. Um, our estimates, as I said, are two-thirds of 10-year-olds globally are unable to read and understand a simple story. Sub-Saharan Africa is the region most affected, and that can reach about 89% of 10-year-olds, followed by Latin America and the Caribbean at 79% and South Asia. Asia at uh, 78 percent. So if you, if you stop and think about it for a second, the, it is a daunting, daunting challenge. Um, some of these children are struggling. Many of them drop out. So we work hard to try to get them into school and then to try to keep them there. Thank you. We all know <laughs> stories from our own global context about the ways in which learning has backslid on uh, national assessments, not only for basic learning, mm -hmm. but even more advanced learning. But yet, it's also been a time of positive disruption in, in, and innovation. So let me go all the way to Rachel. Workplaces were transformed by COVID. And I wonder um, how that played out with respect to the work that Guild does at the intersection of workplaces and employee benefits and education. 
Well, first, thank you. I'm grateful to be here. Uh, so employers innately understand the connection between learning skills and then ultimately the output or the productivity of the business as well as the employee engagement and satisfaction. Um, but it's not the CSR, the corporate social responsibility that it used to be that's pulling employers into the business of education. It's actually four key value drivers. Um, first, it's recruitment. So companies that are engaging in offering education and skilling to their frontline workforces or their whole workforce are seeing a dramatic improvement. Healthcare, the most exacerbated shortages in the US right now where we at Guild are primarily focused, are finding that nearly 50 to 60% of their employees are applying for the job if the company uh, advertises the education and skilling or career mobility services that come from our platform. So it's dramatically improving recruitment it then has a massive impact on retention, um, and that tends to make sure that the education investment pays for itself. Companies find that a learner in their building retains at nearly 2x the rate of an employee who isn't engaged in learning and skilling. Um, and then it helps employees achieve career mobility, which is the number one thing American employees are looking for right now, given the wage increases that we actually saw during 2020, 21, and 22. Workers are now saying, okay, I'm now paid at the, the first wage that I want, but I'm thinking about my second wage. How do I move up? within the organization or move onward in a way that advances. And employers are really attuned to that because if they don't harness that engagement and if they don't harness that interest, then they end up in the wage wars that sort of persisted through 2021. So those are the three key reasons from a pure ROI perspective that employers are really engaging in education and skilling. And then I think because we're here in this global stage, it's worth noting the other that's quite macro. I don't know an American CEO right now who isn't concerned about the rise in populism, the distrust in capitalist systems, and really the lack of engagement in democracy. And um, what we know is that there's a deep connection between providing career opportunity and the building blocks of that, which are education and skilling, to the 100 million frontline American workers who, regardless of their political persuasion, are the ones saying, I don't trust the systems anymore. I don't trust higher ed, I don't trust democracy, and I don't trust capitalism. And I think if we don't fix that in the United States, what we see spill over are populist policies, lack of globalization, and lack of global thinking that will impact, unfortunately, every other democracy. And the most thoughtful CEOs digging into this work will tell you that's the macro reason Reason that they're investing in the skilling of their workforce. Mohammed, what Rachel just said sounds to me like a great opportunity for systems change. If people are questioning existing systems of higher education, education, employment, from your vantage point as an investor in education, what have you seen that you think we should retain from some of the changes in education in the pandemic? What's the opportunity for systems change that you see now? First of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, we, sh we acknowledge that we are living today a turning point in, in education, and that requires probably a revisit to the classic model of global education <laughs> that we are currently experiencing. Uh, yes, technology is, is evolving, and it's evolving faster and faster, and we should expect it to continue to do so, and I don't think we've seen the tip of the iceberg yet. However, there are challenges that are across the globe, you see it in education, that are quite contradictory in nature. For example, today as innovations such as AI-enabled solutions and machine learning and what have you are, are being adopted in, in, in countries around the world, this is faced by decreased social interaction among youth, increased rate of mental illnesses among students. If you think of countries that are underserved, where we are, there's a big drive to prioritize access to education in, in those markets. This is being faced by a rapidly evolving labor market and a changing uh, skill set that is required for, for those youth. So I believe we need to take a, a pause and acknowledge these uh, ch challenges and think of ways to address them. And this should guide our investment, uh, our investment uh, mandate. Uh, in, in my personal belief, to answer your question, I believe that the classic classroom, classic education model is dead, officially dead. 
uh, this classic model is when a student goes to school for 15 years, then graduates from a university. Th those are the privileged ones. Uh, graduates from universities uh, and ends up with a huge loans and start their, generate their first dollar of revenue in their mid-20s and then struggle in their career later on. I think this model does not support the future anymore. Um, so I don't know if, if, if everyone, I see eyes that are looking at, I don't know if everyone agrees, but by show of hands, if who of you think that today's young learners are pre prepared for the challenges of tomorrow? Nobody in the room. Yeah. And that's the, the role stream, of education. For the record, nobody raised their hand. And, and yeah. that's exactly the role of education. It's preparing young learners for the future. And we, I, I agree with you. I don't think they're prepared. Uh, there's, we were discussing yesterday the, the emphasis on emotional quotient and learning quotient versus IQ. Who of you believe that EQ and LQ should be more emphasized over IQ or alongside IQ in, 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 the, in the job market? Most of the room. Mm -hmm. However, today, you would notice that all of us in our corporates and, and many of us around the world still have to follow the IQ testing in the standardized testing across, across the world. So I, I would like to, to, to highlight something which, which the World Economic Forum, along with partners who are here in, on this panel and in the room, have, have worked on, which is the Education 4.0 framework that had outlined, sorry, the skills, the abilities, the attitudes, uh, and the values that will be required to prepare anyone virtually for the future. But in order to implement this, we need to contextualize it. What works in, in one market might not work in another market. If you take, for example, underserved markets, where the real problem, challenge, is access to education, it's training teachers, it is attracting talent, it's trying to bring basic technology into the, the model, then the focus should re really be along any innovation or technology or investment that would bring the classroom closer to the students, to a wider number of students at affordable prices, very simply. If you think of more developed and mature markets where these are the source of innovation and R&D and technology, I think I would focus then on identifying those innovations that have the potential to be scaled at a global platform and a global level uh, to, reach, to reach the majority. However, in, in growing markets, which is a bit in between, this is where the golden opportunity lies. Because th this is, I'm, I'm closing on, on the education model. The real opportunity lies in creating this new model of the future. This is the education model where it's less number of years for education. It is subscription-based and not fee-based. It is skill set-based and not degree-based. And it's educating the student throughout a lifetime and doesn't stop at any point in time and makes education more fun. So let me bring in Ashish and Jeff on those on some of the points that you've made. Ashish, you and I share something in common in that we both run entrepreneurship education organizations. And I know we often both talk in our organizations about mindsets and skill sets, even more so than content mastery. Talk a little bit about why skill sets and mindsets, as Muhammad and others believe, might be more coming to the fore as we think about education from here on out. Sure, thanks, Shidi. Great comments, Mahal. I'd say that, um, so we as an organization of junior achievement, uh, we actually modified our vision to be explicit about skill set and mindset being uh, critical to building thriving communities in the future. The challenge is we, for a long time, not just at JA, but really in the education of business and establishment, have not been able to measure any progress on mindset shift. And what you measure gets done, I think we all know that. The challenge with measuring mindset has been historically, um, when we've tried, a, a we meaning the, the uh, people who work in education, I know many people in the room here are in the education industry in some way, the measurement of mindset gets complicated fast. As a parent, if your child gets a B in math, you react a certain way. But if your child gets a B in empathy, you react in a completely different way. And when we've sort of seen assessments of character, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, measurement of something like empathy, it's been very, very challenging to get adoption for teachers and for school systems to be trying to come up with programs to measure progress on these so-called soft skills. 
So uh, one thing we've done at Junior Achievement is we, is we rolled out um, the Entrepreneurial Skills Pass. It's a competence-based measure, just like you were talking about. Uh, and it's not about getting A's and B's, but it's about proving that you've made progress on a certain group of soft skills. These, 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 these skills are aligned to the Education 4.0 framework that was launched uh, just yesterday here by WEF. And, and this is just one framework of many, I would say, that are um, uh, making it possible to build consensus across all the different regions of the world and all the different um, stakeholder groups for what are the skills that we should be measuring. What are the mindset and skill set sort of elements that we should be measuring? And the good news is there's now psychographic measures. There's great academics who've worked on how to, on, on how to measure self-efficacy, on how to measure grit. So we can actually now finally not just teach to the test, but actually give students and teachers and the, um, and the, and the people who work in education some tools to make real concrete progress on what we all believe is necessary to prepare young people for the future. Thank you. And Jeff, um, your, your firm works around the world as well. And I wonder, multiple panelists have already raised this dimension. How do we pursue innovations in education and upskilling with a lens toward equity, especially given the, the range of, of readiness of systems in places around the world? You know, well, the pandemic contributed to this skills gap, this learning loss. It also transformed learning from a classroom first approach to an online first approach with many of the communities that we serve in the world. We focus on the workforce and the workforce moved from classroom first to online first. And the beauty of online is it's inherently more scalable and inherently more inclusive. And the work we're doing with the platform to reach marginalized communities and those who have special learning needs is really quite extraordinary. So first, think about economically disadvantaged communities. Online learning really is massively disruptive to the cost of delivering learning solutions. And so we're partnering with organizations like I Am The Code that's focused on teaching a million girls and young women in marginalized communities for example, in Kakuma, in, in uh, refugee camps, to code, but not just to code, but also giving them soft skills, important soft skills such as wellness, which is necessary to be successful in the workforce. Those who have physical disabilities and learning disabilities are well served by the platform. Whether it's closed captioning or auto descriptions, audio descriptions that are embedded in the platform, we're also using AI to create custom learning journeys for people with a wide variety of learning styles, including learning disabilities. Online learning is unconstrained by geography, time zone, and language. So that lends itself to helping those who are geographically displaced, Ukrainian refugees who have technical skills but lack soft skills and language skills necessary to find new work. Women in the, who have very difficult schedules, who need to do their learning after hours, uh, or in some parts of the world have safety concerns and can't go to the classroom safely, but can learn at home online. Perhaps the largest community is the deskless worker. 80% of workers don't have access to a computer or desktop but they have access to a mobile phone. And so what we're doing with the platform is really focusing on how to deliver it as a mobile solution. It's no longer the 45 minute lecture, it's bite-sized snackable learning. Three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, strung together with AI to form custom learning journeys. Massively immersive, and by the way, it's not just video anymore. It's online mentoring and coaching, it's assessments, it's gamification. It's a wide range of technologies that are creating a, a more absorbing and connected way to learn online. Thank you. So we've all been talking about various innovations that we're either involved in or promoting. But I'd also like to ask a potentially provocative question. All of this is well and good. However, we all work in contexts where most of the learners that we interact with are getting their main learning experience from government education systems who make the rules 
and provide the funds or don't provide the funds. And so I want to ask the panel, and maybe we can go down the line, in light of all the things that we're pursuing, when you really take a cold hard look at it, what do you see national education systems doing? Do you see them changing? Or do you see them slipping back into old patterns just because the pandemic is slowly coming to more of a close? Catherine? Well, I think, I think it's, it's hard to generalize about that because I think it really does depend on the context. But I think you're making a, a broad, correct point, which is education for the most part, especially for children, is delivered by ministers of education, right? Ministries of education around the world. I think what we need to do, and, and this is a challenge for everyone here at Davos and for people who are thinking all around the world about innovative things, is how do we <clears throat> sort of feed into that system? That system is not, it, it's kind of the best game in town and it's flawed, right? So what, what UNICEF says is, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to provide foundational learning. That is key number one, <laughs> without question, that kids have got to learn how to read and do basic things. All of the things that you all are talking about beyond that, I think are really important, but the question is how do you figure out how to take that to scale? It's not easy, I, I, don't have a, I don't have an answer to it, but I think that is the challenge of saying, yes, we need to do innovation. Yes, children need access to technology, all the rest of it. We know that in many places, children don't have any access to computers. They don't have electricity, right? So you're, you're dealing with really different situations, but I think that I would say start with foundational and then think about ways to work with these ministries to show them best practices, to give them ideas of how to do this at some reasonable cost uh, and, and really bring these things to scale. Thank you. Who else would like a word on this question? And let me just uh, prompt the audience to get ready. We're going to launch into our question period in just a few moments. Who else would like a word? Ashish. I can just say that you know, the metaphor I like to think of for the education industry at large, particularly the government funded portion of it is like a super tanker that wants to turn. Um, there's a little thing on a super tanker called a triptych, which allows it to turn a little bit faster. Um, it, it's a part of the rudder, think of it that way. And then there's, and there's speed boats around the super tanker, uh, run by amazing social entrepreneurs like many people in this room who are doing education innovations and some of the programs we've heard here, which are very innovative, that are kind of guiding the super tanker to turn. And we have to think of ourselves as doing both, trying to use that triptych to move faster and turn this, the, the uh, super tanker, but also make sure the speedboats are all heading in a direction that we want to turn. That's the metaphor I like to use. Very good. Jeff, Rachel? Look, I would say that uh, I believe it can't all be left to national education systems or state and local education systems. Uh, I, I was on the board of a charter school system. Great innovative work being done there in the United States by charter schools. Uh, in my world, you know, the life, learning is lifelong now. You know, Everyone's going to need to be reskilled many times in their careers. And so the employer needs to play a role in that. And then there's a role for so social entrepreneurs and civic organizations that are making the learning that's available inside the workforce available to people who, who lack the benefit of, of working but need to find jobs. I would say a simple framework that we think about is that um, we think governments ought to fund more education and skilling. Employers ought to inform more of what is learned. And the end user, the learner, ought to have more agency in how they learn. Does anyone have a word of advice for ministers of education or decision makers in education about what they could do or maybe should do at this moment in time to, um, to become more innovative and open up their mindset to some of the ideas we've been discussing. Mohammed? Sure. I think um, on, on, to that point, I believe in, in markets where their funding is available and where the private sector has penetrated, my message to the policymakers would be think of collaboration and cooperation with various stakeholders. You don't need to solve the problem on your own. There are amazing companies and technologies around the world. There's a lot of models that have worked in certain markets. And there is a private sector that is willing to invest behind these projects and, and ensure its sustainability and long-term value creation. And you don't need to solve problems on your own. All of what you need to do is, first of all, open up and embrace change, acknowledge that change is required, and then start thinking of what models work in, in different markets. 
you know, I want to build one thing. There is a critical need that I see uh, in our uh, humanitarian work and our CSR work. The biggest gap is c connectivity and devices. Uh, and so even though we're not in the device business, we're not in the connectivity business, we end up funding that when we go into places like, uh, like Africa to do our CSR work. Would love to see enterprise companies who are in that business step forward and do something about that. Governments as well, there's a role to do something about that. Well, thank you all for this rich discussion so far. Well, let's move to our question period. I see a number of hands up. Do we have a mic circulating? Thank you. So we'll bring the mic to you so that the live stream audience can also hear. Uh, please int uh, introduce yourself before you ask your question. And if you want to direct it to someone, please let them know, please. Hi, my name is Sion Bylock. I'm currently the president of Barnard College at Columbia and about to go be the president of Dartmouth. And I guess I'm a super tanker in your analogy. <laughs> and um, so I'd love to hear about where you think the opportunities are to collaborate with large institutions, universities, um, where you've seen that done successfully and where you think we might think about success or even what sure. the role of our universities like mine are in these discussions. Um, please jump in. Uh, what a privilege to be able to share some insights with an incoming university president of such an important institution and prestigious one. Thank you for the opportunity. I will say, um, you know, higher education is changing. We all know that. And um, every university is carving out what makes them unique. Um, there, you know, some like Northeastern have leaned into the, the, the relationship with business through cooperative education. And others have found ways to um, uh, deliver meaning from liberal arts education uh, in, in a world where um, that meaning is harder to see for the student as well. So I guess in your situation, what I would say is encourage partnerships with not just corporations, but all different types of employers around the world to allow young people to think of not just study abroad being this amazing experience they get, but some immersive experience they get, not just working for a company. It doesn't have to be like a co-op situation, but something which gives them a real tangible experience, which gives them more meaning from whether they're studying English or history or you know, business and engineering. So that's the advice I would share. Yes. Uh, May I add very quickly to what Ashish said? Sure. Excellent comments. Just to add on the other end of the spectrum, so you highlighted the employment post-graduation. On, on the front end, there are a lot of technologies that are looking for partnerships with universities to test some virtual reality and augmented reality and immersive learning uh, technologies in the classroom and how to transform the classic classroom experience into a fully immersive experience. Mm -hmm. So I would just advise to, to open up and, and try to pilot some of these there that could be helpful. I see our mic is here, so let's go right here. Hi, I'm Hadi. I'm Hadi Partovi. I'm the founder of Code.org. Uh, we advocate for schools to teach computer science, and we've helped 75 million students learn computer science through their schools. Uh, and my question is for Mohammed. Uh, you know, you, you said that the current education system is effectively extinct, and the entire audience agreed with you. Nobody said that people are getting prepared. And the slide shows that three quarters of students are off track to learn the right skills. Meanwhile, the Education 4.0 Alliance at WEF has laid out the skills that are needed are computer science, digital skills, creativity, and collaboration. That's the, the high level of the taxonomy. My question is, how do we get the existing education system, the ministries of education, to recognize that their system is dead unless they teach the new skills? And what would we advise them to remove from the current system to make the space? Because education is well-funded. It has $10 trillion a year in mm -hmm. terms of budget. Uh, but that, that money is being spent on the wrong skills, not the right skills. So how do we get that message and how do we get that shift in the, those funds? So you insist on getting me in trouble. I'll, I'll try not to get in trouble. No, uh, with, with, with all um, honesty, I think I agree with, with the comments made. And I think the changes need to be structural, like really fundamentally different. The model today where the curriculum is to provide a well-rounded knowledge most of which or some of which will never be used in the future and by the time that student graduates it's irrelevant to their to their career or aspirations need to be completely rethought i think we need to decrease the number of years by which this this that learner enters the workforce it needs to be at an earlier age education needs to be continuous which means after they enter the workforce and they get into skilling and all of that there are a lot of 
partners out there who could continue to help that person navigate the labor market and transform from one job to another and achieve or gain the skills that are required based on the skill set passport that was created by the World Economic Forum or others that, that are out there. So the change needs to be really fundamental. This sounds too theoretical, I agree. And it will not happen in the most mature markets. And it will also not happen in the underserved market where the problem is electricity. But it will happen and it can happen in markets that have funding, that have talent, and that are now ready to kind of figure out how to create a model. I think it's in those markets where we can pilot such a, a, a concept and then try to scale it to the, to the global platform. Rachel, I hope that answers your question. Rachel, let me get your take on this, because I imagine that perhaps national policymakers who are interested in job creation and employment might be uh, a little bit more interested in some of the innovation space, particularly in a time of highly constrained labor markets. What's your thought? They, yes, and, uh, you know, even in, uh, I'll give an example, in the United States, we have basically two different bodies working on the same problem called different things. We have uh, higher education under the Department of Education, and then we have a Department of Labor that has a workforce development arm. And the reality is those two are the same now. Higher education and workforce development are two sides of the same coin. We were uncomfortable with that for a long time because there's a, and I'm in this group, small percentage of us who as consumers hired college for a coming of age experience. I happened to be born into privilege and so I got to hire college for that. That is not what the vast, vast majority of Americans, let alone the five billion who need to be reskilled in the global economy, want to hire their education organizations for, and in most cases, hire their governments, <laughs> even if you can think of it that way, treating them as a consumer. And so I agree with you that there are po individual policymakers tinkering on the margins here, but I agree with Mohammed that it is the seismic reform that needs to happen is so difficult to describe because we need to rethink even the 100,000 person departments that run this in our developed economies. Catherine. I, I just like to make one quick point. I, I, I think you're right in that we have to really look at this in different ways. If you, yes, education is, there's a lot of money in the education space, but in many countries, education is so underfunded, it's astounding because the, even if they take 20% of their budgets, they start with no money, right? They have no money. And so these schools are serving so many purposes in places they're, they're providing lunch for people. You know, there are places where uh, we're trying to keep girls there as long as possible to keep them from getting married. So in a sense, it's, it's serving a different purpose. There are places where a lot of violence happens, right? And they're trying to protect against that. So these schools are being forced to do a lot of things at one time with incredibly meager resources. And so I think, you know, look, I, you know, I grew up in the United States. I mean, I, you know, my kids went to like fantastic schools. I, I want every cool kid to have that opportunity in the world. But we're in a really difficult situation in many, many places. And I think the challenge is to say, teach them how to learn, you know, teach them how to read, teach them how to, how to do numbers, and then build in a system somehow that, that embraces this creativity, gives them the potential to use technology, but does it in a way that is recognizing the incredibly challenging circumstances that these schools, teachers, administrators are facing. You know, think about how to support these principals and teachers so that they can be uh, forward thinking and thinking about skills, but also really keeping in mind how challenging the circumstances are. Thank you all for that. Next question. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Hi, I'm Fahed. I'm a global shaper and um, I run NAFTA Lebanon, which is a collective of multiple stakeholders and putting schools at the center to shape the future of schools in the country. Um, um, uh, first, I want to thank you for br always bringing the reality because it's very important to think of the future but while uh, thinking of the reality. Um, and it's very important also to think of um, uh, uh, a different model of, of the schools. But I think my question to you is, what's the different model of development that you are practicing in order to approach things differently? How are you stopping creating dependencies for communities to work with you and rather build more sustainable development models? Jeff, would you like a word on that one? Well, I think your, your question is, how are we creating a more sustainable model? And it's inherently sustainable because really the cost of delivering an online experience at the margin is close to zero, right? So we can 
start, we can, we can deliver it, whether it's being delivered into a school in Kakuma or to a global 1,000 employer, we can deliver to the employee and then we can continue with them. Uh, we're also working with employers to reach out beyond the four walls of their enterprise to train people who would like to work for them but don't have the skills to work for them. Uh, and so there's a lot that's being done uh, te with technology that just wasn't possible when it was all about the classroom. I, I just want to say something that it's also very important for everyone who's either an impact investor or a development practitioner to keep asking uh, this question. Because even though, the, as you're saying, I think it still creates dependencies for communities to work with organizations. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, 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 I'm part of uh, JA and Jazz Lebanon, and we're, uh, we're trying to do something that's very interesting to really decentralize how a nonprofit that has been working for 20 years, and rather than uh, schools depend on this nonprofit, having this nonprofit program within all the schools sustainably, systematically there. So I think we need to push more questions and think more critically of that rather than just saying, yes, we're building skills and this is, and this is sustainable. That's my opinion. Rachel. Just one other addition on that is I, I think you have to align shared interest. Um, the joy of the work we've been able to do is that we've aligned the interest of the universities and learning providers and platforms, the employers and the employee who becomes the learner. Um, but to do that, you have to have a shared outcome. And I find in so much discussion about education, we miss, we rename the inputs. So we've moved from uh, degrees or higher education or the Carnegie unit to skills, to competencies. Those are all still inputs for the learner. Um, and we speak about them in a systemic way. What the learner or the worker wants is career mobility. And often what the government wants is GDP growth. And those are, those are uh, nested within. When we create career mobility for all workers, we create GDP growth for all economies. And so I think shifting the conversation away from constantly rebranding the input, which is helpful, I believe in skills and competencies. I'm glad we're moving away from degrees and Carnegie units. But naming the shared outcome is the only way you can then drive shared interest and incentive alignment to fund sustainable models. Quick word, Ashish. Quick word. So we have 8 billion people in the world now. We're going to have 10 billion. Um, almost all of that growth is in Africa and Asia. So sustainability is going to be critical. If we really, really believe that you know, every child in the world is worth helping in education, we have to divert resources to the place that need it most. Right. And that is going to have some very difficult conversations for sustainability. One way to do that is exactly what you said, which is a very sophisticated train-the-trainer model, where you can transfer without having to raise more money and enlarge education budgets and create more aid by really creating systemic change. Let's go to the back of the room and then the front of the room. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Priya Lakhani, uh, CEO of Century Tech and uh, one of the WEF uh, sort of tech pioneers. Um, thank you so much um, for, for the comments. Um, I just want to bring it a little bit back to lost learning and, and some of these really dire stats um, that are on the, uh, on, on the sort of slide um, up top. So one thing with governments, right, who are in charge of their state education systems is that they're the super tankers, right? And when you want them to pivot, pivot in K-12, in primary, secondary, which affects those children on those stats there, they always want to see the impact of the innovation before trialing the innovation, which is really interesting because when you're coming up with innovation, it's very difficult to show the impact um, without trialing it first. You're in this chicken and egg. And I just wonder, we've heard a lot, and I know the Skillsoft team, which I'm so impressed with, um, and I've met them and met Rachel at Guild and, and Ashish's work. Um, how could we leverage you in your enterprise impact work? Because where I've seen you do, have loads of impact, People are really willing to use your technologies. They're really willing to have those entrepreneurship courses. They're willing to work with Guild in the USA. And you have got lots of impact. But you're working with a very willing non-super tanker. And so in order to essentially not find that we're working with people in enterprise who are older and further education and coming right back to K-12, like you know, primary, secondary, before they get to you, how can we leverage you, what could you do to show the super tankers that using technologies in a sustainable, scalable way, train the tra all these models work um, to convince those risk-averse policymakers that actually innovation 
is needed in education and it can work. But I think we need to use you as a case study. So how, how do we do that? Thank you. A couple quick words from the panelists. What are good proof of concepts that you have already? Well, one proof of concept is uh, one of our units is Codecademy. So we've taught millions of young people to code um, online. And big part of that, are, are, it's a free service. There's a, a paywall. So to get more advanced skills, there is a subscription. But there, there are tremendous number of people. I meet people all over the world who say, I learned to code on Codecademy. So we can demonstrate that. I'd love to see it in the schools, because I, I do believe that coding is a Having exposure to it is a, is a critical skill, and I'm so glad that it's been integrated by the World Economic Forum into the 4.0 model. Catherine, how does UNICEF think about outputs these days? You know, it's interesting. We have something, and I'm not, Cynthia, I can't remember if you, if, you, if you know the name of this. It's called like the gateway effort or something where I'll, I'll send it to you. But essentially, we are, it's going to go live in March, and the idea is to put best practices up on this site. And it, the reason we're doing it is because education ministers come to us and they say, People keep coming to us with all sorts of ideas. And to your point, yeah, you know, they want to know that it works, right? Because they have limited resources, they got to invest it. So this is, an, this is a place where people can put information about programs that they have, ideas they have. And so ministers have a place to go and see these things. And UNICEF will work with them to try to see if, if it works in their, in, their con company, or in their country. Because I think the challenge is they are overwhelmed. They don't really know where to go and what to take. And they don't know what works, right? So we'll say to them, well, we've worked with Microsoft on the learning passport. That's a good thing, right? We can endorse some of them. We can be helpful. But I think there needs to be a place where everyone can go and put their things, because otherwise it's just, it's just a cacophony of voices and learn this, code, do this, you know, and people don't really know where to go. So I, I think if I can encourage everyone to, to take part in that, it would be really helpful. Let me go to our last questioner here. Um, my name is Wenjo Hinjaroge from Kenya, and I have to first commend you for constantly bringing us back to the reality. Half the world is in the global south. Mm -hmm. um, and these are people who are constantly being left behind. Mm -hmm. The truth is that today we are talking about the metaverse. I come from Kenya. There are people who've never seen a laptop or a computer in their entire lives. So what are we doing here? Um, it's sexy to talk about all the things you're talking about. But is it time we rethink our model? When I see UNICEF, my country has recently reviewed its curriculum to a competent-based curriculum, but I assuredly tell you they are completely struggling with the implementation. And this is a story for every other third world country. We want to catch up, but we also don't know how to catch up. When I look at UNICEF, I see a brilliant opportunity because government listens to you, and you also have the opportunity of bringing all these stakeholders together to intentionally do the work. Yeah. We've done a lot of talking about how do we bridge the digital divide, but can we start working? Because when will we ever catch up with the rest of the world? When will we ever have just the basics of understanding how do I use a simple computer? Even before I get to the fourth industrial revolution, which is something totally out of reach for most of the people. So I think even as we're having these discussions, I think it's important that we, we are in touch with the reality and remember that we will try to move forward and leave the rest of the world behind because I don't know what the competition is about. Mm -hmm. But if we are mindful, and we have a chance of, of the great reset, we have a chance to move together as a people because at the end of the day, even those of us in the global south, we're really human. So I think I would really, I'm looking at how do we much and really reduce this gap? And how do we start moving and actioning um, instead of talking? Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. And I'd like to use this opportunity to call further attention to WEF's Education 4.0 yeah. project and the opportunity that it presents to actually do what you just admonished us to do. One of the fantastic developments of this project is WEF's identification of 16 so called lighthouses around the world in many different country contexts with many different types of education systems at, in countries with varying stages of development and varying stages of economy. And I think the real opportunity for all of us, and a few of us, including my organization, are involved in this. The opportunity here is to be able to do the work on the ground in these country contexts with reference to these next level skills that the forum and all of us, all, many of us here, believe are important and use them as potential proof points for scaling and further implementation and to build the policymaker and institutional support that so many of us have called 
uh, attention to in this conversation. We are almost out of time, so I would like to thank you all for a fantastic, robust discussion. Let's have a round of applause for our panelists.